Hey Church family, happy Vision Sunday. Our new fall ministry season is already off to an amazing start. Before we talk about some of the great new things that are going on in our church, let's look back for just a moment and give thanks to God for the fantastic summer of ministry and mission. Park City's Baptist Church, it's game on. Our Vacation Bible School theme for this past summer. We had over 1,100 children and volunteers right here on our campus. What a great time it was to learn about the message of Christ. And it was an incredible summer. We have watched over two dozen of our kids respond to the message of Jesus and are being baptized throughout this summer and this fall. And it's been a great season for PCBC kids. During the course of over 12 weeks and over 100 sessions at camps, campers learned about sports, art, dance, but most importantly, daily campers learned about God's love. And this summer we had an awesome series about the Ten Commandments. Behold His mighty hand! And we never stopped proclaiming Jesus in our worship services. We sent adults, students, and families to be on mission with God in places like Guatemala, the UK, and South Texas to share Christ and to serve others. We built new relationships with students, and we're excited to launch into this new school year. And Student Life Camp was an awesome first-time camp experience for our grade school kids. And we ended the summer right here together, getting Jack Lowe Senior Elementary ready for their best year yet at the Back to School Blast. But it doesn't stop here. We've already kicked off a new kids' worship experience on Sunday mornings, a cool new high school gathering called Crew, and a great Wednesday at Park City's lineup that includes Bible studies, children's choir, and Awana. We've added new connect groups, and our Fall Discover Park Cities class has brought many new faces to join in on our journey here. And it's almost time to join together and serve out in our community on Serve Dallas Day. Is there a happier church to be in? Let's celebrate all that God is doing. Hey, good morning. It's a happy day here at Park Cities Baptist Church. And again, to all of our guests, we're so glad you're here. You've come on a good day because the day is uh, Vision Sunday. We're going to talk about what's happening in the life of our church and then where we're heading. So I have a special message for everybody here. Uh, and so uh, afterwards, also, it's a happy day, big day, because it's Baptism Sunday. So uh, we got lots of folks who are going to be baptized and we want you to come join us. We got Steel City Pops here and a lot of great celebration outside after the service is done. So don't don't rush off to eat. Come have a Steel City Pop and come and join the celebration. There's nothing greater in the life of a church than when we see our, our friends uh, family members, others being baptized. So come join the celebration. It's a happy, happy day. So we've been walking through this series. Uh, we've just kind of let it be the smiley face. And it's really kind of hashtag happy people. We've been talking about what it is to be happy. Jesus says in the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are or happy are those who do this and this and this. And today I want to talk about happy church. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and here's the reason. Part of the reason we went into this whole series uh, of messages, which has been awesome, by the way. The whole reason is because I run into a lot of Christians these days who just aren't happy. Um, now, this I don't know. This is a new thing. Not everybody's happy. And I don't mean like hyped and, and you got to be always, always, you know, over the top happy. Jesus said it's blessed. There's this deep sense of joy. But it's it's this sense of happiness that all things are right. And, and of all people on the planet. Christians should be the happiest people on the earth and the church should be not Disney World. The church should be the happiest place on earth. And so I'm going to talk about that a bit today. But here's the thing. A lot of Christians that I talk to today are fearful. They're anxious. And here's the deal. A lot of you know, don't you? You know that there is something going on. It's almost like the, the earth below our feet is moving. There's a shifting of something. There's tectonic plates or something that are moving, and there's some kind of movement going on. We can sense that something's wrong. Something is shifting in our culture today, but we can't quite put a finger on it. Well, Oxford Dictionary has put a finger on it. You know, every year, Oxford Dictionaries, they choose a word uh, of the year. And recently they chose a word, it's a hyphenated word, but it's the word post-truth. Post-truth. They chose this singular word to uh, summarize, to best summarize what's going on in America and in Europe. Really what we call really the global West. Post-truth. 
And, and they described it this way. They, they noted that our society now defines truth by feelings rather than facts. Now, we've been saying for a long time, Christian leaders uh, have been saying for a long time, man, truth is now among many uh, and for many people, it's, just, it's relative. There is no absolute truth. There's no final authority of truth. It just is what it is. You, your truth up against mine, whatever you believe, that's all good. You may not believe what I believe. And yet what's crazy about that is just it's Aristotelian logic that says it's a law of non-contradiction. If see, A can't be B. Like you can say that you believe that, but I might say this. Somebody's wrong, right? But in our culture now, for you to have a conviction of truth means not only that you're kind of an odd, odd person, right? But now it's becoming more and more in our society. It's more and more a dangerous position is what people believe. Like, wait, you're one of the, you believe there's actual truth. You sense it, don't you? There's this, 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 this warring of two ideologies that are going on. And one is, is this truth-based right, culture that many of us have grown up in, or as Christians we have. And then there's this post-truth, post-truth ideology. The two are warring against each other. Now think about this. It is a truth-based culture um, that... that, that that Christianity really is, is all about. You could describe it that way, that it's the Word of God that brings truth into our lives. And everywhere that Christianity has flourished in the world throughout history, that nation has been blessed. You think about how, how, how Christianity goes into uh, parts of the world and brings, brings compassion and comfort and healing and hope to the people. Uh, everywhere that, that the gospel has been shared, you, you can see uh, hospitals rising up. Schools being born, literacy rates dropping. Why? So that people can read the Bible. Why? So they can understand that there's truth in the world. God's word is truth. And he sent his son who is the way, the truth and the life. Wherever Christianity has gone, where the gospel has advanced, people have been blessed. They've been made happy. And the word of God even tells us that. Happy are those who come into the presence of the Lord. They're happy to worship Him. They discover that there's purpose and meaning in life because they hear truth. And this truth tells them there's a God who loves you. That that your failures are not fatal. Your, Your life is not futile. There's purpose and meaning. And your death is not final. That there's actually a purpose in this life. And yet for For so many in our day now, this is not a reality anymore. In fact, we could argue that for Westerners, all of this has all but disappeared for the global West. And in fact, of all the many books I read this summer, one of them was one entitled uh, Hope of Nations by John Dickerson. He's a a prize-winning research journalist uh, and a seminary-trained pastor, a theologian, and he, he writes this. You can see it there with its post-truth declaration. The team at Oxford planted a flag, a mile marker between two eras in world history. Friends, this is what you're sensing, what's going on in our lifetime right now. And it is the shift, this shift from one era of history to another that underlies the global and social unrest we see now. That's what's going on. So uh, we, we used to live in a truth-based culture. Now we live in a post-truth culture. And these two radically opposing ideologies are warring against each other. And this post, post-truth breakage is the fault line underlying the earthquakes that we're sensing and feeling, the tremors that you're experiencing every day. Many of you, you'll watch the news. I know a lot of Christians do this. We watch the news. We're just scared to death. We're so fearful and so much of what's happening when we see terrorism and other events, warring ideologies, much of what we see that strikes terror and and fear in our hearts that we see on the news can be traced back to a post-truth ideology warring against the global West. And it is happening and, and we see it in many different ways. One way you see it is in politics. So much in the news nowadays, right? Over the past couple of, of years in the last presidential election, you might know that more millennials voted for Bernie Sanders, who many would describe as a socialist, right? Um, more voted for Bernie Sanders than they did Trump or Hillary combined. 
And, and so now we're moving to, from this kind of democracy, all right, which I could argue is biblically based, that all men are created equal. All people have the, these, these in, unalienable rights, right? The pursuit of, of happiness being one of them, of, of justice and, and freedom, that everyone has been created by God. See, these are truths that establish a culture and a society and a government. But now we're seeing this shift. And so in the next election, in 2020, we're going to see uh, the millennials, that same group now, will be the largest voting bloc in history, by the way, now larger than the boomers. But it's going to happen in 2020, and we'll see how that goes. It doesn't bode well uh, for where that's heading, because all I would say to my millennial friends, whom I love, and I have great hope for your generation. I'm not one to throw rocks at the millennials like a lot of people do. The problem, we don't have a millennial problem. We've got a discipleship problem. That's on us. That's on my generation. That's on the former generations. We have not discipled and raised up this next generation. But see, here's what's happened. Um, if we, if I just want to say that, just read history, right? Or like me, if you, and if, you, if, you, if you can, go to a communist country. I've, I've seen it. It doesn't work. Socialism doesn't work. In fact, many of us, if you know anything about history, you look at post-Christian Russia. It was Eastern Orthodox Christianity. But you look at post-Christian Russia, you end up with the Soviet Union, we call it, right? But the USSR is actually the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. And when we think about post-Christian Germany, we call it the Nazi Party. But, but Hitler's party was actually the National Socialist German Workers' Party. That's the way of socialism. And by the way, again... Vote. Think about it. We've talked about the Reformation in Germany and all that took place there. And then you see this post-Christian move in Western Europe and it ends up with a completely different ideology. And, and now we're seeing these things warring against each other. How about this? Another, another tectonic plate, a movement, this earthquake shift that we're going to see right now. Currently, the U.S. Is the, is the leading economy in the world. Now, that doesn't surprise most of us. It's been that way for a while. But China is fast approaching. Right. So you got U.S., China, and then third growing quickly is India. All right. Within 50 years. So over the next 20, 30 years, we're going to see this shift. And the largest economy in the world is going to be China. Then it's going to be India. Then it's going to be the U.S. Then it's going to be Indonesia. And now you might say, well, Jeff, thank you for this, you know, economic educational moment but you say why is that such a big deal check this out not just because well we're not king of the hill anymore no listen china commun atheistic communism all right you've got uh the united states okay and we are the fastest growing group in our nation right now are what we call the nuns n-o-n-e-s those who have no affiliation with religion at all the fastest growing group in our nation and then you have uh, India, which is uh, one of the fastest growing nations in the world in terms of population, Hindu. All right. And then you have Indonesia, which is uh, predominantly Muslim, in fact, radical Muslims uh, in Indonesia. So you have these warring ideologies at play. And every time, uh oh, every time one, the, war, the first, the top economy has been overtaken by the second in our history, there's been a war. And I'm not here to scare everybody. I mean, some of you are thinking, man, Jeff, I was happy until I, until I came to church today. I, thanks. I was happy. But now all this doom and gloom. No, I'm not trying to bring doom and gloom. I'm bringing reality. But we don't have to despair. And you're saying, what? Why not? How can we live in this kind of a world? And how are my kids and grandkids? You know, that's where some people are. What's it going to be like for them? It's going to be different. I promise you that. And if it keeps going this way, we're going to continue to see these warring ideologies. And we wonder, how can the church prevail? How can God's people prevail in that kind of climate? Well, we already know. Because Jesus has told us. In Matthew chapter 5, it says that he drew the people. He went up on the mountain, drew them together. His disciples came close to him. It says that he sat down and he, he opened his mouth 
And he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who uh, are peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake or for righteousness sake, he said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, he said. Be happy for your reward is great in heaven for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see, Jesus says there's a way to live in every moment in history. And he tells us in the Beatitudes this different kind of way to live. And listen, make no mistake about this. As we've walked through this, or if you're new today, the kingdom of God is a present reality. This is not a kind of, hey, beam me up and get me out of here. Because a lot of Christians live that way. Even today, I'm telling you all these things happening or you're watching the news. Man, we got to retreat. We got to escape. We got to go hide out in the church is what we've got to do. No, he's called us to come together. Yes, we're going to talk about that. Uh, The church is critical that we're here today, that you're even hearing this today, worshiping Jesus today. But we go and we live this life. Jesus is saying, listen, my king, my, my kingdom has people, my subjects Uh, Under my reign, there's a dominion when you talk about kingdom. There's a reign. There are people. There's subjects. There's there's a movement of God's people. And we're to live as blessed, happy people in the kingdom of God. And he tells us this is how you live. And it is a radical way to live. Jesus is calling us. Friends, listen. He's calling us to actually believe that this is the way that we're supposed to live. And to actually live it out. And think about it. If we live this out individually, and that's how we are truly happy in the world, then wouldn't it stand to reason? Then collectively, we live it out together, and we are the happy church. We're the happy people. And people say, man, how are those people so loving? How is it that they're so happy? Because when we live out the Beatitudes, this this really is the Jesus life. The kingdom life is the life that Jesus called us to live. We can't do this on our own. We are empowered by the Spirit of God, and we live it out. Jesus himself embodies this life. And so we live out, following him every day. We live it out, and we embody the life of Jesus. And so how about this? Together, collectively, we come together, we embody The life of Jesus together. We're the happy church. It's why we're called the body of Christ. Because people can see the visible church loving each other and loving the world. A happy life embodies the life of Christ. And a happy church embodies the life of Christ. So friends, this is what we've called to do and how we've been called to live. And you you might ask, well, how do we do that right here? Park City's Baptist Church. I'm glad you asked. It's Vision Sunday. I want to talk about that. Okay. In fact, I want to share a bit of where we're heading as a church. And I want you to hang with me here because I want to drop a lot of of info on you because I want everybody here on the same page. All right. It's important. You know, we have this these family meetings and let's be on task. And so, listen, if you're a guest, if you're thinking about joining our church or maybe you've been coming, you haven't yet joined. Today's your day. I want you to hear all that's happening just over the next 120 days, kind of a uh, 120 day horizon towards towards Christmas, really from now to Christmas. Uh, I want to talk about where we're heading. Last spring, we did this. I just do this really a couple times a year. And we came to you last spring. We said in our What's Next series, we talked about what's next for our church. Uh, We announced at that time uh, that we had purchased the final uh, uh, plot or lot uh, of land over here behind us here, just south. We own all of that land on Villanova now for future use. 
And we celebrated that because that had been decades in the making. And that was awesome. We then we really looked uh, during that time. If you were here that day, you might remember we looked at our history. We had a lot of fun looking at our history. And uh, we we talked about George W. Truett, who said there ought to be a church. And we said we the line we kept talking about, there still ought to be a church here. And I would just want to say that again today. There still ought to be a church right here, right now, and for this uh, current cultural moment and for the next generation. You and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for others who said there ought to be a church right here. And so here's what I want to talk about. A key focus in the coming year, all right? Just the bigger banner of where we're all heading. Our entire staff, our, I've shared this with our deacons, communicate and integrate our discipleship pathway at every level of our church. Now you say, well, what's the discipleship pathway? Uh, I'm glad you asked. And many, most of our members know this. We talk about it's our strategy towards making disciples who follow Jesus every day. And, and really four components. The first one is worship, right? We want everybody to worship weekly is how we say it. Happy churches worship weekly. Happy people worship with happy people weekly. So we worship on Sunday morning, Resurrection Day. It's critical that you're here. Every single Sunday and that you come, if you're in town, that you're here. Happy people worship weekly. They connect weekly. We have our connect groups. Every person, friends, listen, should be in a connect group. You ought to be in a Bible study with other believers where you connect with each other, with God's word and with the mission of our church. Worship weekly. We connect weekly. We serve regularly. And, and we have opportunity to serve our neighbors always. But we give opportunities as a church to serve our city, and the world. And then we multiply as a lifestyle. Multiplying. See, Jesus said you're going to make disciples. Happy people are disciples of Jesus who are creating uh, a movement of God in their own lives among the people they're with. Who are, whom are you discipling? If you are a follower of Jesus, you've been called to make disciples. And a lot of people think, well, that's just kind of this big, you know, corporate machine of the church that's come out spitting out disciples over here. No, it's every one of us discipling people, investing, pouring our lives into our students, into our children, into other adults. And it happens, yes, through worshiping, connecting, serving, and then all of us multiplying as a lifestyle, sharing the gospel. And so for the next 120 days, uh, we're going to focus on four key areas, all right? And here they are, real quick. The first one I'm going to just call guest experience. And what we mean here, this has a biblical you know, basis for it. We are happy to welcome outsiders into our church. And frankly, I mean, we do a good job of this. I, I have people all the time tell me how loving our church is and all that. But we need more and more people. We need to help every guest come. And we hope you feel this way today if you're a guest. We want every person to feel welcome into this place. And we want every young mom and young father to know where their child goes and to be in a safe environment with people that they, they connect with and know that they're going to be loved in. We need more and more people to help. We need people to help happily uh, Help in the parking garage and happily opening doors, holding doors for people and helping people come in with with uh, kids and, and and even elderly folks who need help. We want to help people find their way in and bring care to all people. We need more volunteers. We need you to help serve. What's your ministry? How are you helping? Another we're going to be focused on another area of focus is really spirit led, spirit filled worship gatherings. Now, you may say, man, I've, I sense that every time I come. We want to continue to grow our worship services. And here's the challenge. I mean, I, we want to grow deeper spiritually. We want the Spirit to lead our services. Uh, we, we want more and more people to be able to come. And, and our, our structure that we, we um, you know, uh, instituted last November has been great, but it's created some other problems. And, and if you're here every week, you know this. Uh, the problem in the Great Hall is we're packed. What, what's kind of cool is we're just like about close to a thousand here and a thousand in, in the sanctuary, another, you know, 100 plus, 150 or so in the gym. And and uh, and but it, it's 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 a great, you know, we're kind of kind of balanced there. But the problem is the great hall is not that big. Right. And so we want to uh, let you know that already it has started. There's if you ever need an uh, overflow or you want to sit out with your little one, you can sit out in the hallways here. You can watch the services. 
you can uh, go to the overflow and clearly there's seats in the sanctuary. All right. So but, but we're going to be calling on some of you to help us out. We want connect groups to say, man, let's make room for guests. See, that's the kind of mindset I want us to have. We're looking at all of our worship services to say, how can we grow younger? How can we continue to reach young people in what we do in our gatherings? They're always letting the Spirit lead us. We've got a group that's looking at our Espanol ministries right now. What are our next steps as we seek to reach more and more uh, Hispanic people moving to the Dallas area? Uh, one of the largest growing uh, demographics in our city. The third thing we're going to focus on over the next 120 days, so we're moving towards Easter together, is what we're calling Rediscover Park Cities. We're going to be walking all of us through our Discover Park Cities uh, material essentially through our sermons and through uh, our connect groups. And we're going to have uh, all this aligned in the month of November because we want everyone of us to understand what God's called us to do here in this place. We're going to worship, connect, serve, and multiply every one of us. And then the last one, the fourth one, is mission engagement. All right. Local and global mission engagement. We have an all serve day in October. So watch for this. Again, this happens primarily through our uh, connect groups. And it's not just a day. We have several. We've got a couple of Saturdays and you're going to be able to be a part of that. And a lot of opportunities will move towards Christmas. We're going to leverage every Christmas gathering we have. I'm talking about Sundays primarily, but also we've got the majesty of Christmas. We've got events and we want to invite our friends to come. This is why we're doing this, gang. And then this might be the year that you're going to get involved in ministries locally here in our city and help serve people in need through our mission efforts. It might be the year. Listen, this might be the year that you go on a mission trip. Be life changing. I just want to highlight a few of them. OK, because I believe God is prompting some of us here right now to go on some of these trips. We got a trip to Nepal in December of this year. There's a trip to Cambodia, March uh, 2019. You can still be a part. Just just contact our mission office and say, what? Tell me more about this. Uh, there is a trip to Kenya. I'm going with Dr. Brad Bowman. I'm going to help lead this trip to Kenya in July of 2019. Now I'm into next year. But I want you to be putting these on your calendar. There's a, actually a meeting for that one, an info meeting, October the 14th. Just watch for that. Uh, our students are going again to the UK, had an incredible experience there, and to Colorado, where they had amazing experience with our students this year. And then always constantly developing deeper, deeper relationships. South Texas, Guatemala, Cuba. I mean, it's going to continue to happen. Taking the gospel to the nations is what we're doing. Now, we're doing all this as we build our base here, right? If we don't do that, then we can't do that. It's both and. And so I want to give you an update on facilities, all right? And I want you to, again, stay focused. Some of you are going, I don't need to know about facilities. Listen, facilities is all about reaching more and more people. In fact, a lot of what I talked about, it, it, you know, we've got to have facilities to do so and to improve our facilities if we must, or change what we might need to change. Last spring we came to you, and, uh, and we, we told you there's going to be three areas of focus, really, and there's a fourth one that I can tell you about, but we said there's going to be this west access into the sanctuary. Some of you know that's done. If you hadn't seen it, you need to go see it. It's awesome. The east access is being done, and it's going to be completed, hopefully by the end of the year, if not into the new year. So that's, that was one of the areas. The other was to look at our sanctuary, really the kind of an updating or refurbishing of our sanctuary uh, for future generations, right? And for current uh, events and worship services that we now have. We talked about possible changes there in our sanctuary. Um, we also, and there's, there's a group now, what I'm doing now is telling you, we have a committee that's been working on each one of these. There's a, there's a committee that's looking at the sanctuary. And, um, and we have a committee that also is looking at what we called at the time the link building. We're calling it now, and we did then, but it's the new family ministry building. Why? Because we want to reach more families. And this is right there, you know, between the Great Hall and the sanctuary, uh, where you see the kids' playground. It's kind of that whole area right there with lots of possibilities for how we can uh, have a family ministry area. We have a committee that's looking at that as well. Incredible, talented people who are looking at all of these different areas. And we have a steering committee then, you might guess, that, uh, that is actually communicating, making sure we're communicating and collaborating between all these. And then I said there's a fourth one. We have a columbarium committee. Okay, all these groups are working together. Greg Boyd is bringing leadership. 
Uh, he is awesome and doing a great job along with our deacon leadership. They're going to be coming. We're going to be coming to you along the way uh, to, to bring updates. In fact, they had to, we told you there'd be this listening tour. They've, they've gone into uh, our connect groups, four different connect groups with nine different groups that came together. And they've been so encouraged by the information that the, that the church family, excitement, the church family brought, but also ideas and input. And then you're going to have opportunity as a church as we bring forth, um, uh, you know, later this year, report uh, on how you can be more informed and then ultimately how you can uh, bring decisions uh, to bear on all of this. So full disclosure always, we promise to continue to keep you updated. It's kind of why I'm doing it today. We're always going to do that in a timely manner so that all of us can know what's happening. So continue to pray for us uh, as the process moves forward. Speak into it, you know, contact um, our executive pastor's office, my office. You can talk to anybody on any one of these committees. So we'd, we'd be glad to help you out. But please pray as we move forward. All of this so that we can be the happy church God's called us to be and bring the happy news of the gospel to more and more people. Uh, I came across this verse. I love this. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 and 8. It says this, How happy are your people? Oh, God, how happy are your leaders who stand in your presence and receive wisdom and direction from the Lord. Isn't that awesome? That's my prayer for all of us, all of our leaders who are helping guide us, our deacon leadership and all these committees that are working. It is awesome. But listen, don't miss this, gang. Here's what we cannot miss. We have been so blessed as a church, right? I mean, you don't have to be here long to know that. Happy Churches are blessed by God, but we are blessed in order to be a blessing. This is not something where we just can't gather around and say, man, what about us? You know, and how awesome is it that we are here together? A happy church is marked by generosity. A happy church is marked by a firm identity in Christ. A happy church is worshiping the Lord, connecting with one another. A happy church is serving those who are in need and praying for those going to visit people in the hospital and in, in our nursing homes and, and caring for young moms with new babies and dads who are fi- trying to find their way. Happy churches are seeking to raise up godly women. Happy churches are seeking to reach out to men to help them be godly men. You're going to see uh, upcoming uh, the Heart of Man film that I want every man in our church to be here in the Great Hall that night as we show uh, the film, The Heart of Man. It is life-changing, and we'll hear more about that in the days to come. But y'all check this out. So wh- how will we live in this new post-truth world? Uh, there's, there's a window in time where we have got to be prepared because this is where we're heading. And there's really no stopping it apart from a dramatic move of God. And, and so how do you live in this post-truth, post-yes, church post-Christian era? Well, again, Jesus has told us. He's shown us how to live through the Beatitudes and through His life. But I'm going to offer just kind of a manifesto, all right? As we think about how we're going to live in the days to come. First, we will remain rooted in Scripture. We, God's Word will be our, our truth. And this coming year, 2019, we're going to walk through what it's you know the year of the Bible, something like that. But we're going to be walking through the Bible together. We're going to be learning the scriptures together on every level across the life of our church. I'm so excited about this. We're already in planning uh, about this, and, and it is going to be incredible. You hear a lot more about it in the fall. We will train up our children and our young people. They're going to be ready to face this new reality. We will be known for doing good in this new current and, and future reality. We will love others. Our mission efforts here in Dallas and around the world, we will show compassion to people. We will dignify all people as image bearers of God. We will seek to protect every child. We're going to raise up a children who know and love the Lord. We're going to raise up women to be empowered, to, to use all of their giftings to serve the Lord in leadership and in ministry areas across the life of our church. And we are going to stand in the face of social injustice and we're going to bring solutions to systemic racism in our city and around the world. 
We will make a difference. We're going to be known as ambassadors for Christ. That's who we will be. And when people meet us and they see us, they're going to see us in the marketplace, in our schools. They're going to see us in business. And we are ambassadors for Christ, representing the King from our colony of happy people within a nation uh, that is declining morally. It was Eugene Peterson who said, the kingdom of God is a colony of heaven in a nation of death. This is what the church is. We go out to be light, to be salt in the world. And watch this. We will love those who persecute us. Because Jesus told us to. We will not be outloved. And when someone comes at us, we will follow the way of Jesus. We will love those who persecute us. And watch this. We will remain calm in the midst of chaos. People wonder why we're not fearful. We will be fearless in the face of change. A.W. Tozer is the one who said a scared world needs a fearless church because we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And if God is for us, then who can be against us? A happy church is a, is a blessed church, and we're blessed to be a blessing. I want to close with this. It's kind of a famous quote from arguably the greatest uh, Baptist preacher who's ever lived. Um, sorry, it's not your pastor, but a guy named Charles Spurgeon. Many of you know, he preached in London uh, another, back in the 1800s. But um, he says that he writes this. I love this. Give yourself to the church. You that are members of the church have not found it perfect. And I hope that you feel almost glad that you have not. If I had joined or no, never joined a church till I found one that was perfect, I would never have joined one at all. And the moment I did join it, if I had found one, I should have spoiled it. For it would not have been a perfect church after I had become a member of it. Still imperfect as it is, it is the dearest place on earth. I love that. Church is the happiest place on earth. Because think about it, the church should be the happiest, right? We're the kindest, most loving, most forgiving, most generous. We're we're the most caring, compassionate people on the planet. It's the happiest place for people to gather. After Charles Spurgeon said that, the, the church is the dearest place on earth, he said this, and this is my challenge for us as we close. The church is faulty, but that is no excuse for you not to join it. If you are the Lord's, Join the church, nor need your faults keep you back. For the church is not an institution for perfect people, but a sanctuary for sinners saved by grace, who, though they are saved, are still sinners and need all the help they can derive from the sympathy and guidance of fellow believers. The church is the nursery For God's weak children, where they are nourished and grow strong, it is the fold of Christ's sheep, the home of Christ's family. So here's my challenge for you. Are you a member of the family of God? Are you a part of His kingdom? Have you received His grace? Has there been a moment in your life when you said yes to him? Christ died on the cross for your sin, took upon himself your sin, your shame, so that you could be forgiven. He paid the price for your sin. Have you received his grace? And if not, I want to guide you in a prayer. I want you to do that even now. But I want to challenge you the rest of you with this. Are you a member of the local church? And for some of you here, are you a member of this church? A group of happy people preaching and teaching the Word of God, growing together to be the church He envisioned us to be. Join the church today. And on this day of baptism, this is your day. You can come and find us in our Next Steps area right after this service. And we can talk to you about being baptized today. We have all that you need to be baptized right out front today. We'd love for that. How happy would it be For us all to come together and watch you be baptized today. How awesome would that be? So, hey, let's pray together as we close. I want you to commit your heart, your life to the Lord. You've heard a lot today. You know it. We live in 
shaky time. We live in a, a crazy, uncertain time. I want to ask you, have you given your heart to Christ? Do so now. Say, Lord, I give you my life. Maybe you have, today you've decided, I am going to live for Jesus and Him alone. I will not fear. I will follow Him. Maybe you need to commit to join the church today. Right now, say, I'm going to go. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to someone. Maybe you need to be baptized. Perhaps you need prayer. Whatever your needs are today, we are here for you. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your church. You have made us glad because you have come to rescue us from our sins. Now we can live for you as your kingdom people, as salt and light in the world. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.